So let's do this. Let's break down the toe touch piece by piece from top to bottom and show each representation of what is required to actually touch your toes. And then we'll put all the pieces back together. So at its simplest, a toe touch is simply a shape change. If we imagine ourselves as a tube, what we have to do is be able to compress one side of the tube and then expand the other. And so that's where my slinky comes in is a pretty darn good representation because if I want to bend the slinky, what I have to be able to demonstrate is the expansion on one side and then the compression on the other. And we're really no different than, than the slinky in regard to how we will accomplish the task of bending forward and touching our toes. The question then becomes, do you have the capability to create a compressive strategy on one side of your body and an expansive strategy on the other? And then can we shift these fluid volumes to allow us to accomplish a positional change that is required for us to eventually touch our toes? So let's do this. Let's break down the toe touch piece by piece from top to bottom and show each representation of what is required to actually touch your toes. And then we'll put all the pieces back together. Once we understand what's required to actually touch our toes, then we can start to look at the compensatory strategies that actually may be limiting our ability to do so. So one of the first things that we have to be able to acquire to bend forward and touch our toes is an anterior compression and posterior expansion. And, and we'll address this first from the, from the thorax. So I need to have this dorsal rostral expansion posteriorly and compression anteriorly to allow me to achieve that initial forward bending motion to acquire the toe touch. So we're just like the slinky. We need that posterior expansion, anterior compression. But to understand how this is acquired, we also have to have lower cervical flexion and upper cervical extension. So if I cannot extend in the upper cervical spine, chances are I may actually have a limited toe touch unless I have some other compensatory strategy that will allow me to compensate for that upper cervical extension. The upper cervical spine mobility relative to systemic mobility is actually found in the literature. There was a study a few years ago where they were looking at the straight leg raise as a representation of hamstring flexibility. And what they did is they performed a suboccipital release manual technique to increase upper cervical spine extension. And they noted that there was an increase in the straight leg raise. So their interpretation was is that it influenced hamstring flexibility. The reality is it's just an, a component of the ability to create expansion where we need it to allow the eccentric orientation on the posterior aspect of the axial skeleton to uh, allow the hip mobility to be demonstrated. As we move down the axial skeleton to achieve the toe touch, we have to have eccentric orientation of the spinal erectors. So longissimus thoracis comes to mind because of its attach attachments to the sacrum. And so I have to eccentrically orient here. That typically occurs somewhere in the general vicinity of about 45 degrees of forward bend where that eccentric component comes into play. The thoracic erectors have a very strong extension moment. So if they're incapable of achieving this eccentric orientation, the chances of bending forward to touch your toes are pretty slim. As we move down towards the pelvis, the pelvis is going to be, have to expand anterior posterior as well. So this is going to be an inhaled position of the pelvis, which would require a counter nutation of the sacrum. So the base of the sacrum needs to be able to tilt backwards. This allows the lumbar spine to flex forward, and that allows us to achieve our forward bend. As I create this posterior expansion I, and I change the shape of my body to allow me to bend forward, I'm eventually going to pick up some required element of, of hip flexion. To do that, I'm going to have to pick up a degree of sacral nutation. So the base of the sacrum is going to retilt forward slightly. This has to happen because I need a posterior expansion of, of the, the pelvis to maintain my center of gravity over my feet. If I stay counter nutated the entire time, What's going to happen is I'll get a forward shift of my center of gravity. I'll plantar flex, which will try to push me backward. But because I don't have posterior expansion for balance, I'll stop my toe touch at that point in time. Keep in mind to acquire this amount of hip flexion, I'm going to need an eccentric orientation on the posterior aspect of the hip to allow me to achieve this degree of hip flexion. For those of you that are interested in muscles, it's at this point where the hamstrings would really come into play as a limiting factor. But it's not because they lack length. It's because there is some reason that you're maintaining concentric orientation of the hamstring. 
it would be very rare that any muscle in your body actually lacks length. So what can limit your toe touch? Let's talk about the anterior elements first. So let me use an absurd example to make a point. If I was to hold this ball in front of me and try to bend forward, I wouldn't be able to touch my toes. Why? Because there's too much volume in the way. So this can be represented as too much air trapped in, in the lower part of the anterior rib cage, or simply too much volume in the abdomen. Interestingly enough, one doesn't have to be obese to have too much volume in the abdomen to stop your toe touch. It's not uncommon for those that are using compressive strategies in the upper thorax or in the pelvis to actually have a limitation of their toe touch based on too much volume in their abdomen. When this maximum volume is reached, there's only one place for it to go, and that's anterior. If this anterior expansion is sufficient, it can actually limit your ability to bend forward and touch your toes. So just like squeezing a toothpaste tube from the top, if I use an anterior or posterior compressive strategy just to breathe, I'm going to push more abdominal content straight downward. Similarly, if I'm using a posterior compressive strategy in the pelvis and I'm pushing the guts downward from the thorax, the abdominal contents will eventually move forward. That reduces my ability to compress the anterior aspect of the axial skeleton, expand posteriorly, and I can no longer bend forward and touch my toes. So is it possible to touch your toes even though you may have a compressive strategy? Absolutely. So it's not uncommon for people to be able to cheat a little bit. And so one of the most common places to cheat is in this thoracic area. So some people can eccentrically orient those thoracic erectors and allow them to bend forward and touch their toes, even though they may not have normal expansion in the pelvis or in the upper thorax. One of your confirming tests is actually watching them squat. So these people can often squat below parallel. However, their strategy is very obvious. You'll find that they have to crane their head and neck forward or they have to reach forward to maintain their balance. Those people are actually achieving eccentric orientation above the level of the pelvis. To offset their center of gravity, they have to throw more weight forward, which is their head and their arms. In the cases of the extreme representations of flexibility in, a, say, a gymnast, over time through training, they have learned to eccentrically orient the posterior aspect of the hip to allow them to achieve straight leg raises as much as 130 to 150 degrees. These are people that live with an anteriorly oriented pelvis. So now let's consider some strategies that we may utilize to help us restore someone's ability to touch their toes. If the first requirement is compression of the anterior aspect of the axial skeleton, then any breathing strategy that promotes ongoing expansion of that area is going to be a limitation. So let's take a look at a few strategies that we may use to help us increase the compressive strategy on the anterior aspect of the axial skeleton, and then a few strategies that will allow us to expand the posterior aspect of the axial skeleton. As with most strategies that we're going to use to restore a toe touch, your first step is to restore the dynamic ISA. A key element to remember is to achieve a normal exhalation rather than sternal compression or spinal flexion. Any activity that's pulling the spine downward to a vertical may be actually flexing the spine rather than creating normal dorsal rostral expansion. A simple strategy to assure that the sternum is not getting pulled downward is to initiate the activity with the arms at approximately 120 degrees of flexion. Examples of this would be any pullover activity or any pull down activity that would be initiated from the position of inhalation. Then it's just a simple monitoring of sternal position to assure that you're not using a compensatory compressive exhalation strategy. For those attempting to overcome a compensatory exhalation strategy, something as simple as a cable reach may be sufficient to restore ISA dynamics. So next, let's address dorsal rostral expansion. We need that expansion to allow the shape change to allow us to bend forward. But a lot of folks don't even know what dorsal rostral expansion even feels like. So here's a really simple activity that you can use to actually get a feel for this dorsal rostral expansion. You'll need a surface to rest your elbows on. We want to position the arm about somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees in front of the body. If I support myself on my table, I'm going to depress it slightly and then push down and forward to allow the space between my scapula to expand. Now, 
If I externally rotate through the upper extremities at the same time, I move the scapula into a position of inhalation. So this allows the dorsal rostral thorax to expand. So just simply push down with my elbows slightly. I'm going to feel a little bit of abdominal engagement. I'll feel myself rock back on my sit bones just a little bit. And then as I breathe in, I get expansion between the scapula. Once you get a feel for the dorsal rostral expansion, it's just a matter of applying that into the gym. We can improve dorsal rostral expansion in any number of ways. Goblet squats, zerger squats, and any number of carry variations will promote dorsal rostral expansion. Keep in mind that many of the activities that promote dorsal rostral expansion also promote counter-nutation of the sacrum because of the inhalation bias. We can also simply just use the toe touch activity to restore toe touches. So when in doubt, I can keep it simple. I can use a toe touch variation to allow me to address my toe touch limitations. So in this case, I'm going to use a heels elevated version of the toe touch. The heels elevated position creates an inhalation strategy from the ground up. All I have to do is maintain my heel heavy position and take my inhalation before I begin my toe touch. This allows me my dorsal rostral expansion and my sacral counter mutation. Now, as I bend forward, I'm going to make sure that I exhale to assure that I have a compressive strategy anteriorly. This exhalation also creates enough sacral nutation to allow a posterior weight shift through the hip. As I reach the bottom of the toe touch, I'm going to inhale again to assure that I get that counter mutation I need to complete the toe touch. So it looks like this. So I hope you found this helpful. If you have any questions, please place them in the comments section below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can be notified for the next update.